It seems to me that chapter 10 begins to uh, raise the question of the historical context and the historical specificity of capitalism around the working day in chapter 10, but in yeah. the context of machinery, in the context of labor, in the context of the relation to nature, uh, and in many other kinds of ways, uh, until, of course, we get to the uh, general theory of capital accumulation, where you couldn't have that argument without that historical uh, uh, contextualization, together with the analytical work that went into the early chapters. It seems to me that's, that's, that chapter's the if anything, the crucial chapter in Volume One. Yeah, no, it's the it's the culmination of the argument of uh, Volume One. Um, but what you're saying is really in, interesting and important to grasp, which is the relationship in this book between, if you like, the theoretical logic yeah. and the historical circumstances. And there's a dialogue that goes on between the two. And sometimes you get a little confused as to whether he's actually making a historical argument exactly. or a logical argument. You know, sometimes you think he's making them both together. So there is there is an interesting sort of dialogue, dialectic, if you like, between uh, between that. But uh, uh, in, the, in the chapter on the working day, what you see is, of course, a confrontation with actually existing circumstances. It's very very historical, but you couldn't understand it unless you really understood the theoretical underpinning of it, which is why is it that capitalists are so obsessed with other people's time? And what does it mean to have, to be in a situation like I am a worker and have somebody else totally obsessed yeah. with commanding my time and commanding every second of it? So the, the, at that point the, it becomes, the, 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 the two really merge together, both the theoretical and the, and the historical. Now when you get to the, 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 the general law of capitalist accumulation, to a number of complicated things are going on. There's a theoretical argument which actually stretches right back to the beginning uh, where you have to remember that this book is about a critique of political economy. And what was it the political economists were saying? And the political economists were saying uh, in aggregate, let the free market do its work right. and everything will be okay. So, I mean, they weren't all saying that, but, but there was a, a kind of a free market utopianism around in Marx's time. And Marx said, all right, let us assume that you have constructed your utopia. And it's interesting that that utopian vision of the market doing its work has been around us, of course, over the last 20 or 30 years. We're told again and again and again, let the market do its work and everything will be okay. But what Marx does in this chapter is to say, what will happen? if we let the market do its work. The first thing is that you'll get more and more monopoly, which you're not supposed to have. And, you know, I mean, the idea, the idea is that capitalism should be competitive. And what Marx is showing is, well, in a utopian kind of free market, then what you get is, in the end, the big ones dominate. And of course, one of the things that's interesting to look at in our own history over the last 30 years is the degree to which we've been preached a lot about the free market, but at the same time the incredible consolidation that's gone on in terms of right. oligopolies and pharmaceuticals and en energy and, and, and all the rest of it. So, so it's self-destructive. So he says it's a self-destructive utopian vision. It, 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 it's unstable. It's always going to end up in monopoly. The second thing is, will it work to the benefit of the worker? Because that's what it was, so we've been told, that if you let the free market do its work, then you as a worker will benefit. What, he, what Marx shows is, no, that's not going to happen at all. What happens in a free market society, if you push it that way, is that the rich get incredibly richer and the poor get incredibly poorer. And of course, what's happened over the last 30 years? The rich have got incredibly richer and the poor have got incredibly poorer. And this is the way, you know. So what Marx does is to prove rigorously, actually, that this is what a free market capitalism would produce. More and more monopoly and more and more social inequality. And I think those two propositions that come out in chapter 25 were predictions of what would happen if you went in that direction. And of course, in the 1950s and 1960s, capitalism was not organized along this highly competitive rat race kind of line. Since the 1970s, it has. And so what we've seen is coming back closer and closer to Marx's prediction. And I think this is kind of a crucial chapter uh, to understand both the theoretical argument and the relationship of that and the practical argument.
But the practical argument is contingent. It doesn't say capitalism is bound to end up this way. It says capitalism will only end up this way if you believe that myth about the freedom of the market being uh, the god to which we have to bow down and, and to whom we, we have to pay obeisance. So and I think it's a brilliant chapter in that kind of way. And of course, right now, I think it's devastatingly right. And it's so obviously true that this is what, is, what has happened and this is what's gone on. So I, I always kind of find that chapter a great, a great moment in Capital to say, this is the culmination of his argument of Volume 1. And this is where you're going to get to if you go this path. And wow, and everybody, I think, gets it immediately and says, yeah, yeah, we can see about how that's happened. What Marx does is to try to put together a synthetic model, if you like, of how a capitalist system works, what its dynamics are like. And uh, in chapter uh, 23, uh, he looks at that from the standpoint of simply of the reproduction of the class relation between capital and labor. And you notice. Marx is much more interested in the question of social reproduction than he is in the question of the technical means by which it is done. Uh, chapter 24 really looks at the implications of capital accumulation from the standpoint of the capitalist. So for a fleeting moment in chapter 24 you feel sorry for the capitalist caught in this Faustian dilemma of uh, having to consume or having to reinvest. And uh, you also see that, uh, given the coercive laws of competition, that capitalists are not necessarily free to choose, as Milton Friedman would hope they should, would be, uh, that they have to reinvest whether they like it or not. And that therefore there is accumulation for accumulation's sake, production for production's sake. Now the topic of 20, chapter 25 is to look at what this all means from the standpoint of the laborer, and uh, what it implies for the fate of the working class. And here you will notice that one of the assumptions we started out with, that everything always trades at its value, uh, still holds except in the case of labor power. And we're going to look at that now as something which is a bit flexible and the like. And as often happens with Marx, and we've seen this in the chapter on the working day, but also in many of the passages in machinery and large-scale industry, is that having derived a theoretical kind of positionality, what Marx then wants to do is to go out and say, well, can you see this actually at work in the world around you? So the last part of this chapter, section 5, is very much about, well, yeah, here's the theory, now what do we go out there, what do we see? And of course the theory says that it's absolutely essential for capitalism to function that there be an, an industrial reserve army, a surplus of labor power, and that the surplus of labor power not be kept in a condition of great affluence, but that it be in a position of relative impoverishment. And so by looking at conditions of labor power in cities, but also, more importantly, uh, in terms of rural areas of Britain, uh, and then, of course, looking at the condition of the Irish in relationship to uh, British industry, uh, you get uh, some explanation of why those structures in the population, which can be identified historically at that time, uh, existed. So the theory is connected to the historical realities in this chapter. And I'm going to largely be concerned with the theory, but again I want to remind you that the theory that Marx is going to lay out here is not a theory devoid of assumptions. Uh, the assumptions he started out with that there is no problem in the market, that the way in which uh, 
the surplus gets divided up between interest and rent, profit of merchants' capital, taxes and all the rest of it have no relevance for the argument. In other words, we're just simply going to look at the relationship between a capitalist class in totality and the working class. And that is uh, an assumption which is not really warranted in terms of what actually goes on and what actually exists but nevertheless it's one which will help us identify some of the basic dynamics with which Marx is concerned, as will the assumption that there is no problem uh, in the market. Now, Marx starts off, however, <coughs> with introducing three concepts. And we've encountered the concept of the organic composition of capital once before in capital, but this is the first time that they're being laid out in general. And I have to say, actually, you could construct this argument here without these three concepts if you really needed to, but they are crucial to Marx's thinking, particularly when it comes to volume three of Capital, and they have been crucial in a lot of the argument that has gone on over how to understand Marx's general theory of dynamics of capitalism, so we need to spend just a little bit of time on them. So he starts off then by saying that the composition of capital is to be understood in a twofold sense. The trouble is he then goes on immediately to identify it in a threefold sense. It's a two-fold sense. As value, it is determined by the proportion in which it is divided into constant capital, the value of means of production, and variable capital, the value of labor power, the sum total of wages. And he then goes on to talk about the physical composition of capital, which he calls the technical composition of capital. And he insists, he says, there is a close correlation between the two to express this, I call the value composition of capital insofar as it is determined by its technical composition and mirrors the changes in the latter, the organic composition of capital. Wherever I refer to the composition of capital without further qualification, its organic composition is always understood. Now, what does this really amount to? We have, first of all, technical composition. The technical composition is the physical productivity of labor. And its typical measure would be number of widgets produ produced per worker hour. Tons of steel produced per worker hour. It's a very physical thing. And obviously technological change alters these physical ratios. Rising, increasing productivity means that the number of widgets per hour increases. So it's a physical thing. The value composition is how much the capitalist lays out for means of production versus labor power. And the value composition is really equivalent to C over V. That is, if C is the total amount of value which you have to lay out in terms of gaining access to means of production, the raw materials, machinery and all the rest of it, and V is the variable capital, which you have to lay out, which depends, of course, on the value of labor power. The organic composition is this value composition insofar as it is affected by changes in physical productivity. <coughs> 
Now, let us indicate straight out that there are some problems with this idea. First, is this an internal measure? Or an internal effect within the firm? Within the firm, I change my productivity, i.e., my technical composition. I therefore have to go out into the market and I have to buy more means of production and maybe less labour power. So, as a particular entrepreneur in a particular industry, the ratio of C over V that I'm utilising may change for that reason. But then there are external measures or effects. <coughs> Let's suppose that there is technological change going on in the production of intermediate inputs, production of means of production. That will mean that I have to lay out less in the way of C because the value of C is falling because of a rising productivity in the industries that are producing cotton thread, for example. So the industries that are producing cotton thread become much more productive, cotton thread becomes much cheaper, I have to lay out less in the way of C. Similarly, remember what happens to V. As industries which are producing wage goods increase in productivity, V goes down. So there are all kinds of interactive market effects which can also go on as a result of these technical changes. Changing technical composition of capital in a given industry, which is producing means of production for another industry, these are going to affect the C over V ratios. Now it's not clear from Marx's presentation in this chapter whether he's talking about internal measures only, that is, not including all of these interaction effects, or whether he's also including all of these interaction effects. In fact, he does at some point indicate he understands there may be interaction effects, but these interaction effects are, in his view, relatively muted, for reasons that we'll come back to. Now there is a third possibility, that is the value composition of capital, C over V, is subject to all kinds of other influences. For example, the discovery of a new set of resources, new oil wells, or so that suddenly the cost of, of acquiring a raw material goes down. <coughs> Bad harvests over a series of years, in which case the value of cotton rises, like the value of wheat is rising right now, for those kinds of reasons. And we also saw in the chapter earlier where there are all sorts of other ways in which capitalists can gain surplus value free goods, second-hand machinery, for example, or machinery which is out, outdated but which you can continue to employ for free. So there are all sorts of other elements in here that can affect the value composition. So we can actually suggest that there is a good reason why Marx distinguished between value composition and organic composition because he wants to talk about the value composition insofar as it's affected by technical changes, and technical and organizational changes that affect physical productivity. So that organic composition refers to that, the value composition, as it is affected by this. But, as I've suggested, there is this ambiguity here as to whether we're simply concerned with 
examining what happens in a given line of production or in a given firm, or whether we're actually going to be looking at the aggregate in the economy. His view, he says, is this. The many individual capitals invested in a particular branch of production have compositions which differ, differ from each other to a greater or lesser extent. Some lines of production are capital-intensive, or C-intensive if you want to call it that, others are labour-intensive or V-intensive. The average of their individual compositions gives us the composition of total capital in the branch of production under consideration. Finally, the average of all the average compositions in all branches of production gives us the composition of the total social capital of a country. Now this is a country, it's not of the world. And it is with this alone that we are concerned here in the final analysis. So it seems like he's saying both the internal and the external, after they're all taken into account, run together, that those should be what I understand by the organic composition. Now at this point he just lays out these questions before he then goes on to talk through what in effect is a simple first model of accumulation dynamics. And the argument goes like this. The capitalist has surplus value at the end of the day. This surplus value, some of it is going to be reaccumulated. For the moment we're going to assume there is no technical change, technological change, no changing, changing productivity. If part of that surplus value is going to be reinvested, then you need, need more labour. Therefore, says Marx, accumulation of capital means, as he says on page 764, multiplication of the proletariat and increase in the number of wage labourers. Now, where does this labour surplus come from? So he then goes through the scurrilous views of Mandeville and others, and suggests that Mandeville was more honest than some of the people who came after him in recognising that what is necessary for such a system to work is that there be a pool of impoverished non-workers to be absorbed into this continuing expansion of capital. And he says on page 765, what Mandeville, an honest man with a clear mind, had not yet grasped was the fact that the mechanism of the accumulation process itself not only increases the amount of capital but also the mass of the labouring poor, i.e. the wage labourers, who turn their labour power into force for increasing the valorization of growing capital. This then leads Marx into the beginnings of a discussion of Malthus, and of course uh, the long footnote 6 on page 766 is given over to um, the superficial plagiarism of uh, Malthus and the like in terms of his theory of population and how the hour of the Protestant Parsons struck. Uh, But he then comes back on 768 to say this, under the conditions of accumulation we have assumed so far, notice assumed, conditions which are the most favourable to the workers, their relation of dependence on capital takes on forms which are endurable, or as Eden says, easy and liberal. But it can in fact as this process goes on, the accumulation process goes on over time, absorb the surplus labour and start to lead to conditions of rising wages. So on 7869 he says, uh, 
there can be a rise in the price of labour as a consequence of the accumulation of capital, but he says this only means in fact that the length and weight of the golden chain the wage labourer has already forged for himself allow it to be loosened somewhat. And the bottom he makes this other point, it is clear that at the best of times an increase in wages means only a quantitative reduction in the amount of unpaid labour the worker has to supply. This reduction, he says, can never go so far as to threaten the system itself. And then he mentions, apart from violent conflicts and so on, and he says this on 770, either the price of labour keeps on rising because its rise does not interfere with the progress of accumulation, or about ten lines down, the other alternative, accumulation slackens as a result of the rise in the price of labour because the stimulus of gain is blunted. The rate of accumulation lessens, but this means that the primary cause of that lessening itself vanishes, the disproportion between capital and exploitable labour power. The mechanism of the capitalist production process removes the very obstacles it temporarily creates the price of labour falls again to a level corresponding with capital's requirements for self valorization Now, we can diagram this in this kind of way. There is a certain accumulation of capital. an accumulation of surplus value. Part of that surplus value is capitalized, that it is converted back into capital. This generates increase demand for labour, for labour power. Where is that increased demand going to come from? It's going to come from surplus population. Over time, what will happen is there will be an absorption of this surplus population. And as the surplus population is increasingly absorbed, so we will get rising wages. which either does not interfere at all with the accumulation process, or if it does, means less surplus value for the capitalist. Which means less surplus value gets accumulated, which means there's less surplus value for reinvestment and capitalization to say nothing of the fact that capitalists looking at a situation of this kind will say, what's the point of me going back into the market and paying all of that for labour, I'm not going to get much profit out of it or surplus value out of it, so I'm not going to even bother. So the stimulus for gain is blunted by the fact that wages have risen so high. Now, how could a situation of rising wages not interfere with the accumulation of capital? Can you remember the situation where we discussed that that could happen? In the theory of relative surplus value? Where we argued, right, but increasing, in a situation of increasing productivity gains, 
some of the productivity gains can go to the worker in terms of increased standard of living. So that you can get an increasing standard of living of the worker, i.e. an increase in the value of labour power, which is consistent with increasing rate of exploitation of labour. Okay. So if there is rising productivity going around, around this system, then all right, wages can rise a little bit, but we've still got plenty of. In other words, you don't get less surplus value; you get more surplus value, even though wages are rising. But notice what this does. It basically kind of says that inherent in capitalism is a kind of homeostatic kind of adjustment mechanism of the rate of accumulation and the wage rate that if we looked at it kind of like this, if the, if the wage rate is doing something like this, it's rising, then the rate of accumulation is falling. As the rate of accumulation is falling, so reinvestment diminishes, and so the demand for labour slackens, and so wage rates come down, this goes up, and you could imagine a situation of this kind, that they just simply oscillate in this kind of fashion. It's a homeostatic kind of adjustment mechanism. Wages rise, rate of accumulation slackens, demand for labour falls off, the labour surplus reappears. Now clearly, this surplus population depends upon the rate of population growth, where the population is relative to all of this, so where the surplus population is uh, also matters. So what Marx does here, however, is to, is to say, well, you might notice historical situations in which wage rates and profit rates would be going opposite to each other. Now what would a bourgeois economist read into this? They're going to look at it and kind of say, ah, oh, you see, it's greedy workers. Greedy unions or something like that, they're always wanting more wages and the wage rate goes up, and if the wage rate goes up, then sorry, you're going to get stagnation. I'm sure you've heard that argument, right? If you push the wage rate too high, then sorry, you're just going to get stagnation. And it's going to be whose fault? Labour's fault. So if we get a crisis, it's not our fault, it's Labour's fault. You know, they they push the wage rate too high. But what Marx does is to point out that in this system, as he says at the bottom of 770, he insists, to put it mathematically, he said, the rate of accumulation is the independent, not the dependent variable. The rate of wages is the, is the dependent, not the independent variable. In other words, what Marx is insisting is that it is capital and capital accumulation that is driving this. It's capitalists who are making the decisions, it's capitalists who are pushing the system. So if you do see fluctuations of this kind, it's because that's the way capitalism is pushing it. So this then leads Marx into consideration of what he calls the so-called natural law of population on 771s. So you can tell this is coming given his stuff about Malthus. But he really describes exactly what we've just gone through very succinctly in the middle of 771. He says, if the quantity of unpaid labour supplied by the working class and accumulated by the capitalist class increases so rapidly that its transformation into capital requires an extraordinary addition of paid labour, then wages rise, and all other circumstances remaining equal, the unpaid labour diminishes in proportion. But as soon as this diminution touches the point at which the surplus labour that nourishes capital is no longer supplied in normal quantity, a reaction sets in. A smaller part of revenue is capitalised, accumulation slows down, and the rising movement of wages comes up against an obstacle. 
The rise of wages is therefore confined within limits that not only leave intact the foundations of the capitalist system, but also secure its reproduction on an increasing scale. So this is, if you like, the description of a simple model of the dynamics of accumulation. Which then takes us into part two. 772. What Marx wants to do here is to say, well, this argument we've just made pays absolutely no mind to technological change. That is, you're assuming the technology remains constant in this first version. He says, so far we have considered only one special phase of this process, that in which the increase of capital occurs while the technical composition of capital remains constant. But we know it does not remain constant from the theory of relative surplus value. So he then goes on to observe, given the general basis of the capitalist system, a point is reached in the course of accumulation at which the development of the productivity of social labour becomes the most powerful lever of accumulation. So we're now going to look at this model, if you like, when we introduce into it the dynamics of relative surplus value seeking and technological and organizational change. <coughs> so he starts off then by looking a little bit at the technical composition of capital, going back over this argument, and we're going to see this developed even further now in this section. As far as the technical conditions are concerned, there are both causes and consequences, he says, of changing value composition. Causes are those which arise uh, out of uh, the need to buy new machinery, new means of production, so he talks about buildings and furnaces and means of transport and all those other things. But then the consequence is that you need more means of production. So a condition, sorry, it's not a cause, it's a condition of, of this is you buy a new machine, which means more, more C in the form of the machine, but then the machine also has a consequence, which is that you now need more raw materials. Bottom of 773, he says, this change in the technical composition of capital, this growth in the mass of means of production, as compared with the mass of the labour power that vivifies them, is reflected in its value composition by the increase of the constant constituent of capital at the expense of its variable constituent. And then he uses the phrase, which has created quite a lot of problems, this law of the progressive growth of the constant part of capital in comparison with the variable part is confirmed at every step by the comparative analysis of the prices of commodities whether we compare different economic epochs or different nations in the same epoch. There is, he says, a tendency for the organic composition of capital to increase over time. And he's proposing that we think in terms of a law of the increase of the C over V ratio. That is, you need to buy less and less labour, and you need to buy more and more means of production. 
interestingly, he then introduces on the middle of 774 the possibility that C could also diminish through technological change. But he simply treats it here as something that restrains what would otherwise be a very rapid increase in the C over V ratio, in the organic composition of capital. Here he's saying, in the middle of 774, the reason is simple, with the increasing productivity of labour, the mass of the means of production consumed by labour increases, but their value in comparison with their mass diminishes. Their value therefore rises absolutely, but not in proportion to the increase in their mass. The increase of the difference between constant and variable capital is therefore much less than that of the difference between the mass of the means of production into which the constant capital and the mass of the labour power into which the variable capital is converted. The former difference increases with the latter, but in a smaller degree. In other words, yes, you can get constant capital saving innovations, which reduce the value of constant capital, but this simply holds down what Marx sees as an inexorable law of the rising organic composition of capital. That, in short, capitalism is going to become increasingly capital intensive over time, as opposed to labour intensive. And he then uses some examples. Now, what this means is that the mass of surplus value that the capitalist can gain diminishes unless you can raise the rate of exploitation. And this is a problem. And in the third volume of Capital, he will argue roughly in the following way. The rate of profit is equivalent to S over C plus V, the surplus over the total capital advanced. Now, by a little bit of algebraic manipulation, you can turn this into that this is equivalent to the rate of exploitation over 1 plus the organic composition of capital. from which you would see immediately that if the rate of exploitation remains constant, then the law of organic, of rising organic composition of capital gives you a falling rate of profit. This quantity becomes larger and larger and larger, this remains constant. Therefore, the profit rate must fall. And this is the simplest version of Marx's falling, prof falling profit rate argument. In order to sustain that, however, you have to do two things. One is you have to keep the rate of exploitation constant. And the second is, you have to assume that all of these interactions which are going on in the economy are actually leading to an increasing organic composition of capital. And there are lots of reasons why as subsequent theorists have shown, 
This is not necessarily so. Situations can arise in which actually it goes in the other way, that you get a falling organic composition of capital, simply because the nature of the interaction effects, whether there's a falling or a rising, really depends. On the other hand, if you dare to gainsay, in certain circles, the theory of the falling rate of profit, you know, Marx has come down on you like a ton of bricks. Because, as I think Marx himself suggested, this is one of the main ways in which you can see how technological innovations, i.e., the search for relative surplus value, creates a contradiction. Because you're displacing labour out of production. And as you displace labour out of production, you're displacing the source of surplus value. My own view of it, for what it's worth, is that technological dynamism is indeed a potent source of contradictions within this system. But that you cannot assume there is a law of rising organic composition, but it's always going to be there. Nor can you necessarily assume that there is a law of falling rates of profit. Situations arise in which, yes, indeed, the rising organic composition gives rise, gets turned into falling profit rates. But it's perfectly possible for other patterns of innovation to enter into the picture which reverse that process. So, this is the reason these concepts are important and why you have to think about them. Because they're foundational for what happens in Volume 3 of Capital, and part of Marx's argument there. But what is brilliant about the argument is that most of the classical political economists, including Ricardo, believed in a falling rate of profit. Many of them thought in terms of capitalism in the end winding down. Ricardo, for example, talks about the inevitable demise of a capitalist system because it will not be able to sustain, sustain itself. But all of them actually appealed to Malthus and the idea of resource constraints, and what is known as diminishing returns in agriculture. That there would be an inherent barrier to ra ra increasing productivity in agriculture. And that therefore the end of capitalism was essentially legislated in terms of its relation to nature. What Marx says is no, there is a way you can talk about a falling rate of profit which has nothing to do with nature. It has to do with the internal contradictions of capitalism. As he says of, of Ricardo, it says, you know, Ricardo, when faced with the idea of a crisis, took refuge in organic chemistry. And he says, you can't do that. If there is going to be a crisis of capitalism, it's going to be a crisis which is generated by its own internal contradictions. And I think his intuitions are absolutely correct that one of the centerpieces of those contradictions lies in the dynamic and trajectory of technological and organizational changes. And that these technological and organizational changes are highly disruptive, in some instances, of the capacity to gain surplus value. The trouble is here, he's put it in this kind of law for, for form, and the law form is where we hit some of the problems. <coughs>
Now, this then leads him, however, to say that, of course, this rising organic composition of capital doesn't mean less surplus value for the capitalist, provided that you actually expand your labour force dramatically. That is, by increasing production. You accelerate accumulation. As he says on 774, the progress of accumulation lessens the relative magnitude of the variable car part of capital, but this by no means thereby excludes the possibility of a rise in its absolute magnitude. And then he goes through this example. He says, well, let's suppose the C over V ratio rises, but if in the meantime the original capital, say £6,000, has increased to 18000 its variable constituent has also increased, in fact, by 20%. It was £3,000, it is now 3600 out of 18000 But whereas formerly an increase of capital by 20% would have sufficed to raise the demand for labour by 20%, now the original capital needs to be tripled to secure an increase of 20% in the demand for labour. This then immediately raises the question, where is the surplus capital going to come from to increase from 6,000 to 18,000? How are you going to get that? And that leads him immediately to the idea, well, there is an original accumulation which goes on. And he so introduces this idea of primitive accumulation on 775. The capitalists go out there and they rob people to get the extra eighteen or get the extra twelve thousand pounds they need. Somehow or other they accumulate it. Now he says we're going to look at this historically in part eight, so we'll do that next week. But then on seven seventy six and seven seventy seven he says, well, maybe there's another way in which capitals can, capitalists can do this. And he introduces the distinction between concentration and centralization. Concentration of capital arises in this model in the following way, that each time you increase the amount of capital that's circulating. So you go around this system again and you get more capital, more capital. So concentration means over time bit by bit, increment by increment, you're increasing your capital, and so capital is becoming concentrated. But he then introduces something which I think is always important, because sometimes people talk about a law of increasing concentration and centralization. Because he suggests at the bottom of 776 that not only are you going to get concentration of capital, but you can also get something else going on. Right at the bottom of 776, he says the concentration that accompanies accumulation is not only scattered over many points, but the increase of each functioning capital is thwarted by the formation of new capitals and the subdivision of old. Accumulation therefore presents itself on the one hand as increasing concentration of the means of production and of the command over labour, and on the other hand as repulsion of many individual capitals from one another. And then he talks about the fragmentation of the total social capital. What in effect is going on here is this. Why would you put your surplus value back into the same production system? What happens if I took a part of my surplus value and spawned it off into a new line of production? And I opened up a small factory making something else. So capitalism is not only about increasing concentration, it's also about increasing diversification, increasing fragmentation. And what he's suggesting here is there's some sort of relationship between concentration and dispersal. Concentration and fragmentation. And that therefore you cannot necessarily look to concentration of capital, 
to do what you want it to do in terms of increasing the amount of V which is available to you at a given rate of exploitation. So there is something else which he introduces, centralization of capital. Centralization is effectively taking people over, takeovers, mergers, driving people out of competition and taking over their businesses, hostile takeovers, and the like. And what he's pointing to here is a very important process which goes on in capitalism, which is about centralization, and we start to see how it works, and he introduces at the bottom of 777 a very important idea which he's not going to take up, which is the role of the credit system in doing this. He talks about various mechanisms whereby larger capitals can take over smaller through competition and the like, but then he kind of says, apart from this, an altogether new force comes into existence with the development of, cap of production, the credit system. In its first stages, this system furtively creeps in as the humble assistant of accumulation, drawing into the hands of individual or associated capitalists by invisible threads the money resources which lie scattered in larger or smaller amounts over the surface of society but it soon becomes a new and terrible weapon in the battle of competition and is finally transformed into an enormous social mechanism for the centralization of capitals. Now, of course, one of the main businesses of Wall Street these days is asset and merger activity. I mean, the centralization of capital that's going on, and has gone on under neoliberalism, has been absolutely astonishing oil companies, pharmaceutical companies, they're all kind of constantly merging into each other, telecommunications companies, I mean, they're all constantly merging into each other. And asset and merger activities is just, just one of the big businesses of, of, of Wall Street. And of course this is about precisely the centralization of capital. And what does the centralization of capital do to the workers? Well, it doesn't do them any good, that's for sure. It usually destroys worker organization and worker contracts, increases the rate of exploitation, and the like. So what Marx is on to here is the beginnings of a centralization process in which the credit system starts to play a central role. And we would argue, I think, today that this is, of course, one of the huge drivers of the economy. And Marx is seeing its potential here. But having said that, all he does then is to say that these levers of centralization, which are competition and credit, draws together individual capitals and, and deals with this problem of how to get the extra 12,000 pounds. You get it through centralization. As he says at the bottom of 779, centralization. Uh, can grow into powerful masses in a single hand in one place. In any given branch of industry, centralization would reach its extreme limit if all the individual capitals invested there were fused into a single capital, i.e. monopoly. In a given society, this limit would be reached only when the entire social capital was united in the hands of either a single capitalist or a single capitalist com company. Centralization supplements the work of accumulation by enabling industrial capitalists to extend the scale of their operations, increasing scale of organization. And centralization, he says, is much more dramatic, as he says on 780. Accumulation, the gradual increase of capital reproduction as it passes from the circular to the spiral form, is clearly a very slow procedure compared with centralization. Centralization is much faster. And he then goes on to point out the world would still be without railways if it had had to wait until accumulation had got a few individual capitalists far enough to be adequate for the construction of a railway. So it's consortia and business consortia and things like that that start to move into the picture. And 
he then says, centralization therefore becomes the new and powerful levers of social accumulation. Therefore, when we speak of the progress of social accumulation, we tacitly include these days the effects of centralization. But this doesn't necessarily solve the problem of less and less labour being employed. As he says right at the end, on the one hand, therefore, the additional capital formed in the course of further accumulation attracts fewer and fewer workers in proportion to its magnitude. On the other hand, the old capital periodically reproduced with a new composition repels more and more of the workers formerly employed by it. So what's coming out here is these processes of transformation, both in organizational form of capital but also in technological forms, are diminishing the demand for labor power in the labor market. And the consequences for that are taken up in the next section, but we should probably break here for five minutes and then do the next two sections. The next section, what we get is uh, another version of uh, this model, but uh, with uh, technological change incorporated. And the system really looks uh, something like this that, again, you start with accumulation. But in this instance, we're going to talk about reinvestment, capitalized surplus value, which in this instance is invested in new technologies. which reduces the demand for labor produces a surplus population which gives you a high rate of exploitation, which gives you more accumulation. So he starts off by again assuming a rising organic composition of capital, and uh, but now we're looking at this dynamic in which technological change is becoming central. The demand for labor, he says at the bottom of 781, is determined not by the extent of the total capital but by its variable constituent alone, and this falls relatively to the magnitude of the total capital and, and at an accelerated rate as this magnitude increases. So the variable capital becomes a constantly diminishing report, proportion. The consequence is on 782 in the middle here, he says, but in fact, it is capitalist accumulation itself that constantly produces, and produces indeed in direct relation with its own energy and extent, a relatively redundant working population, i.e., a population which is superfluous to capital's average requirements 
for its own valorization and is therefore a surplus population. And then he talks in 782-783 on what we now colloquially call downsizing. And uh, and the consequence, as he points out on 783, the bottom, the working population therefore produces both the accumulation of capital and the means by which it is itself made relatively superfluous. And it does this to an extent which is always increasing. Now there's a lot of discussion these days about disposable labour and the idea of disposable labour forces. And this is exactly what Marx is talking about. How do we get to a point where in fact uh, we can talk about massive disposable working populations? And how does that dynamic work? And this leads Marx then to point out the bottom of 783, the working population therefore produces both the accumulation, and I've just read that, this is a law of population peculiar to the capitalist mode of production. And in fact every particular historical mode of production has its own special laws of population, which are historically valid within that particular sphere. An abstract law of population exists only for plants and animals, and even then only in the absence of any historical intervention by man. What he's saying here is that you know, Malthus had this law of population that explained poverty again because of these two forces of tendency to increase of population on the part of the labouring classes in relationship to scarcities in nature. So the problem of, po of poverty for Malthus was everything to do with you know, the natural proclivities of the working class to reproduce too fast versus scarcity in nature. Therefore, poverty is natural. Marx is saying that's nonsense. Poverty is actually produced, and this is his point going back to the fable of the bees in Mandeville. Poverty is actually produced by the capitalist dynamic. As he says in the next paragraph, but if a surplus population of workers is a necessary product of accumulation or of the development of wealth on a capitalist basis, this surplus population also becomes, conversely, the lever of capitalist accumulation. Indeed, it becomes a condition for the existence of the capitalist mode of production. It forms a disposable industrial reserve army which belongs to capital just as absolutely as if the latter had bred it, bred it at its own cost. Independently of the limits of the actual increase of population, it creates a mass of human material always ready for exploitation by capital in the interest of capital's own changing valorization requirements. And then he talks about varying phases of reabsorption of some of this surplus that is thrown out of work and then throwing them out of work by another round of uh, technological change. And as he says, this sophisticated system was not really possible in capitalism's infancy. And again he comes back to the irony on 786 when he says, this increase of a surplus population is affected by the simple process that constantly sets free a part of the working class. Sets them free by engaging technologically induced unemployment. Some kind of freedom that is. And he says, again and again, that the existence of a surplus population is absolutely crucial. Seven eighty-eight. 
capitalist production can by no means content itself with the quantity of disposable labour power which the natural increase of population yields. It requires for its unrestricted activity an industrial reserve army which is independent of these natural limits. So in other words, it wouldn't matter what the rate of population increase was. You would still have poverty. Even if Malthus was all wrong about the working class reproducing and being too fecund and all of that, wouldn't matter, because capitalism would simply go ahead and produce its surplus population in this kind of way. And this has a number of effects. One is, it allows the capitalist to discipline the labour force. In other words, it's a constant threat which the capitalist has of forcing unemployment upon the working class. And one of those threats can be exercised in, with the purpose of de-skilling, as he says on 788 at the bottom, the displacement of more skilled labour powers by inferior labour powers. It also allows, as he says on the next page, If the means of production as they increase in extent and effective power become to a lesser extent means for employing workers, this relation is itself in turn modified by the fact that in proportion as the productivity of labour increases, capital increases its supply of labour more quickly than its demand for workers. The overwork of the employed part of the working class swells the ranks of its reserve. The condemnation of one part of the working class to enforced idleness by the overwork of the other part becomes a means of enriching the individual capitalists, and accelerates at the same time the production of the Industrial Reserve Army on a scale corresponding with the progress of social accumulation. Now it's a very interesting thing that's gone on over the last thirty years, which is we've seen extensive structural unemployment at the same time as the existing employed working class, in many instances, has been forced to do overtime, and has been forced by the threat of unemployment to intensify their, their efforts. So in other words, this mechanism of capital is not simply about unemploying people, it's also about exercising a political power over the workers. The result, he says, is that the general movement of wages, in turn, 790, are exclusively regulated by the expansion and contraction of the Industrial Reserve Army, and this in turn corresponds to the periodic alternations of the industrial cycle. And then on 792 in the middle. The Industrial Reserve Army, during the periods of stagnation and average prosperity, weighs down the active army of workers. During the periods of overproduction and feverish activity, it puts a curb on their pretensions. The relative surplus population is therefore the background against which the law of the demand and supply of labour does its work. It confines the field of action of this law to the limits absolutely convenient to capital's drive to exploit and dominate the workers. Here we're taking up the idea of technological change, organisational change as a weapon of class struggle with a vengeance. You come across it in the chapter on machinery. And the oddity of this, he then remarks on 793, is that the demand for labour is not identical with increase of capital, nor is supply of labour identical with increase of the working class. It is not a case of two independent forces working on each other. Capital acts on both sides at once. Capital, in fact, controls the demand for labour at the same time as it also controls the supply of a surplus population. 
and relative surplus population and industrial reserve army. Then goes on to say, if its accumulation on the one hand increases the demand for labour, it increases on the other the supply of workers by setting them free. While at the same time the pressure of the unemployed compels those who are employed to furnish more labour, and therefore makes the supply of labour to a certain extent independent of the supply of workers. The movement of the law of supply and demand of labour on this basis completes the despotism of capital. Capital works on both sides. It has control of both sides. The answer, of course, is for workers to organise, and so Marx here, for the first time, introduces the idea of trade unions and labour organisation. As soon as the workers learn the secret of why it happens, the more they work, the more alien wealth they produce, and the more the productivity of their labour increases, the more does their very function as a means of the valorization of capital become precarious. As soon as by setting up trade unions, etc., they try to organise planned cooperation between the employed and the unemployed, in order to obviate or to weaken the ruinous effects of this natural law of capitalist production on their class, so soon does capital and its psychophant political economy cry out at the infringement of the eternal and, so to speak, sacred law of supply and demand. Every combination between employed and unemployed disturbs the pure action of this law. And then Marx introduces the idea of colonies and so on, as an industrial reserve army, or prevent this creation of industrial reserve army. So the point here is that, in this model of accumulation, what we see is the utilization of capital's command over organizational forms and technologies, centralization, and new technological forms, organizational forms, as a weapon in class struggle which actually regulates both the demand and supply of labor. And this is, if you like, the more sophisticated version of the model of capital accumulation which Marx constructs. And as we'll see in the next section, this leads into the construction or production of a relative surplus population, and so Marx then talks about it. But I would just like to pause here, I think, and ask if you've got any kind of questions about these two models and the bit in between about organic and value and technical composition. Or is it all clear? Yeah. Yeah. Well, one would be, for example, a pattern of uh, technological change, which is capital saving, which is not labor saving at all, but capital saving, i.e., the means of production become cheaper, faster. Uh, and of course, out of that comes uh, some other, I mean, Marx mentions foreign trade, and while he doesn't mention the word imperialism, you could also introduce into this imperialist domination of uh, raw material sources to make them extremely cheap, so that raw materials become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper because of imperialist domination. And uh, and as I've already mentioned, there are patterns of technological change which would not give you a rising organic composition of capital at all, but a stable organic composition of capital, and in certain instances you may even get a declining organic composition of capital. It really depends upon what kind of technological change you're talking about. Now I think there's no question that Marx's intuition that a lot of capitalist technological change is about labor saving is correct. And to the degree that it is biased towards labor saving, it would indeed produce some of the kinds of difficulties that Marx is pointing to. But there's no necessity for that. You could imagine something else. In other words, 
There are people who now would argue that actually you can set up a dynamic model of this kind with the pattern of technological change which is going to equilibrate the system. The difficulty is that, and give you a stable rate of profit over time, the difficulty is to define exactly what the pattern of technological change is that does that. And so people talk, for example, about a knife edge of the appropriate technological change which is going to keep you in balance. You move too far in one direction, you get a crisis of the sort that Marx is talking about. You move too far in the other direction, you've got another kind of crisis. And in any case, don't forget the assumptions we started out with. For instance, if there is a serious problem in the market, then you may want to employ more workers. You might want to give them more work purchasing power because they become an important part of the consumerism that's going to mop up the surplus value. We've ruled that out by assumption so far, that that's, we assume that's not a problem, but you can see that indeed that could be a problem. In which case you wouldn't want to go this way anyway. The social system would have to go in another direction, that is to try to employ more workers as a way of consuming the capitalist product. Otherwise you've got a problem of where does capitalist, to whom do capitalists market their product. Actually, it's very interesting, Marx himself at various points both in the Grundrisse and in Volume 3 of Capital talked about counteracting influences. And he changes his language in Volume 3. The falling rate of profit goes from being a law to being a law of a tendency, to being a tendency. So you see he's beginning to kind of see there may be some problems with it. And at various points, both in Capital and the Grundrisse, he also talks about the factors that can offset the, the law of the tendency of the falling rate of profit. And by the time you've gone through all of those factors, you say to yourself, well, you know, if you add all of these up, this law of the falling rate of profit is no law, it's an inherent tendency which you can see there, and it has elements of truth to it, but you can't call it a mechanical law, and, and it's very dangerous, uh, I think, to, to do that. And after all, if Marx was correct in saying that there's a law of organic, uh, rising organic composition of capital, and there's a falling rate of profit with it. We should have been having a falling rate of profit since 1850 at least. And we should be closer and closer to zero, but we're not closer and closer to zero. We plainly are not. And this, of course, is then again one of the things he mentions is opening up new sectors of production which are labor intensive. Now think of that. And think about what global capitalism has been doing. A lot of the sectors of production it's opened up have been labor intensive. And in fact, the proletariat has increased by about two billion people over the last 30 years. You know, China, Indonesia, and places like that. So new lines of production have opened up, many of which are labor intensive. And actually, interestingly, in China, they're even in some instances dismantling these new technologies, which are highly capital intensive because they're so, they're, they're so expensive. You know, they can buy these new technologies from the United States, very expensive, which are labor saving. Or they can actually reinvent the production process, which is labor intensive. And in many instances they've done that, they've gone back to labor intensive. They say, well, why should we buy this expensive piece of machinery when we have these incredible available labor resources around. Which then, by the way, brings back one point of limitation on this new technology stuff. Can you remember what it is that puts a limitation on the employment of new machines? Until everyone else catches up and gets... Well, until everybody else catches up, but the other, no, the other is that the machine 
the value of the machine has to be less than the labor that's saved by it. Okay. So when you get to the point where the demand for labor and the, you know, the, labor, the wage rate has gone down so much because you've got such a massive surplus population, at some point or other there's no point in, in, in continuing technological innovation. So that cycle will go on until such point, as you remember the case in Britain, which did not employ the technologies which had employed in the United States because there was such a surplus of labor in Britain that they didn't, they didn't make economic sense to employ those technologies. So what you may get is a situation where you produce such a surplus of population in a given place that therefore there's no incentive for technological innovation and you go back in effect, you switch back into this Model 1 situation. So again, there are many situations where you can imagine this. And if you, if you, if you emphasize the fluid possibilities of, of this, and I, in a way, that's why this language of a law strikes me as a bit odd. You know, Marx, uh, generally speaking, is always talking about the kind of fluidity and the process and the capacity, and then kind of to end up with a kind of pretty rigid kind of statement about a law of a rising organic composition of capital as he does here, he clearly thought that he'd cracked the problem of the falling rate of profit. Uh, and that was to come in volume three of Capital. And he felt it very important to insert into volume one of Capital these arguments about organic value composition and technical composition as a foundation for the volume three argument. He never completed the Volume 3 argument. It's a bit all over the place, and as I've suggested to you, the language there switches from law to law of a tendency to tendency, and in any case, there are all these counteracting forces which exist. But I think, as always with Marx, he's onto something which is important, but the way he's voiced it here is in this kind of seemingly kind of rigid sort of form, which I think uh, many subsequent theorists have suggested it doesn't really work. And, um, and these, these kinds of models, by the way, have now been worked out mathematically, so if you want a good mathematical version of all of this, you go read somebody like uh, Morishima, Marx's Economics. And Morishima is a first-rate mathematician and works all of these things out mathematically and basically kind of says, you know, there are instances where the falling rate of profit could occur, but there are plenty of instances where it won't. But what Morishima emphasizes is the destabilizing role of technological change, which I think is right. And if we look in our own society and we look at the patterns of technological change and this relationship to worker control, and the production of a relative surplus population and the role that relative surplus population has played, say in Europe in particular, where it's been particularly strong. I mean, the structural unemployment in Europe has gone on now for you know, 20 years. And this is one of, the, one of the ways in which you try to discipline the labor force all of the time. Hasn't worked too well, but that's one of the part of the dynamics of it. In this country, of course, we've had no need for that. The dynamics have, uh, you know, gone on. Uh, the insecurity that is generated amongst working class labor organization has not been that strong. Labor organization has been effectively uh, kind of minimized. Uh, the paths of technological change are not resisted, and so capitalists can pretty much have it their own way, and in addition, if they can't have it their own way here, they go to China, or they go to sort of Maquila zones, or, or wherever. But again, I think it's very important to recognize, I think I mentioned this before, that one of the biggest sources of insecurity in the labor force and loss of jobs in this country is technological change, not outsourcing. So again, I think Marx is correct very much to talk about the power of technological change to structure an industrial reserve army. 
and create an industrial reserve army, and to put pressures on workers so that they don't, they don't create a problem. And as we've seen over the last 30 years, capital has not shared with workers any of the gains that have been had from rising productivity. Capital has taken it all. And workers have essentially, gained, essentially uh, won nothing in terms of the benefits that come from rising productivity, which was not true in the 1950s and 1960s, was not even true in the 1920s. So that this is a very unique period in uh, U.S. history where uh, none of those gains have been shared. Okay, so there are another other questions. Let's go on to look at section four. We get three forms of the Industrial Reserve Army: floating, latent, and stagnant. The floating essentially workers who have been fully proletarianized, fully integrated into the commodification of labor power, and have been employed but are thrown out by these waves of technological innovation which create unemployment. They are people who are in the workforce and out of the workforce, depending upon the industrial cycle. <coughs> they are typically registered as unemployed. People seeking employment who got unemployed. So you can get a measure of the floating population in this country by looking at data on the unemployed. Though the data is not that great, and the category of discouraged worker ought to be in there as well, which, is, which are workers who have just given up trying to get a job. So you've got a floating population. The latent population are groups in the population who have not yet been fully proletarianized. Marx frequently mentions the way in which women and children were drawn into the labor force. In his time, one of the biggest reserves was, of course, a peasant agrarian population, increasingly thrown off the land. And that has not gone away. If you look at Mexico or India and so on, you'll find an agrarian population that is increasingly being forced off the land into the cities and is a latent reserve. Now, the point about the latent reserve is they have to be mobilized somehow. And by what processes are they going to be mobilized? But there are other latent reserves also. There is a petty bourgeoisie, an independent petty bourgeoisie, an artisan, self-employed population that can be forced into the labor force. So that when we start to talk about latent reserves, we're talking about a wide range of population possibilities. And of course, as soon as we start to think of it geographically, then we would say, well, while the floating reserve is usually you know, around where capital is, a latent reserve is all over the world and can be mobilized. In the 19th century you would mobilize a coolie labor and take it to South Africa or Fiji or whatever. Uh, you'd mobilize uh, uh, Indian labor and take it to Trinidad. Uh, those kinds of things. So the surplus population can be global and increasingly, of course, we saw within, within Europe uh, in the late 1960s, there was a labor shortage in Europe, and labor power was very, and you know, labor was well organized, strongly unionized, 
uh, socialist parties, communist parties. And how was the shortage of labor addressed? Well, uh, the French government went out and organized uh, a massive importation of labor from the Maghreb. And this was official government policy in the 1970s. And they brought them into the car factories and many other areas. I mean, Renault was kind of. Maghrebians came in to, to, into the factories. It was a government policy, which of course is not anymore, you know, now they want to send them back. But the, at, at that time, there was a mobilization of this labor surplus from the Maghreb. And look at the incredible significance of Mexico to the economy of this country in terms of the labor surplus in Mexico. And it's not only in Mexico, it's elsewhere, you know, in much of Latin America, but the Mexican labor surplus is absolutely crucial as a threat against uh, American labor, but also it has to be mobilized, which is why all of this stuff about immigration is getting so kind of interesting, because the more you keep Mexican labor out, the less the threat of that labor surplus becomes. And if you really shut it all out, and we've already seen in agribusiness, they're already hurting. They haven't got the labor surplus. They're, you know, strawberries are rotting in the fields and apples aren't being picked off the trees because the labor surplus isn't available. The, the immigration stuff is there. So the whole kind of question of where is the labor surplus and how it is mobilized. And the history of where that labor latent surplus is and how it gets mobilized in relationship to the dynamics of capital accumulation is in itself a very fascinating history. I mean, countries like Sweden maintain full employment and everybody says, see, you can have full employment in a country like Sweden, and this, what Marx is talking about, doesn't work. And the answer to that is, well, but, you know, there are all these laborers coming from Yugoslavia, Turkey. There was a labor surplus available to the Swedes, and they used it, both as labor control, but also as the necessary labor surplus in order to fuel accumulation of capital. Now the latent category, or the stagnant, or rather the stagnant category, is different from the latent. In many ways it's, as Marx kind of says of it, this is about, he's not very kind to groups of this sort, this is your lumpen proletariat, the almost unemployable population. Uh, in some cases you can have sympathy because, as he says, this is the hospital of the reserve army. And there are people who are so destroyed mentally or physically that they really cannot, it's very hard to mobilize them into the population. You can in extremists. In, in extremis. I guess it's what William Julius Wilson liked to call the, the underclass, a term I don't like, but any more than I like the term lump and proletariat, but what Marx is talking about is there is a group in the population that has been in the, the proletariat but which can no longer function for a variety of reasons as uh, part of that proletariat. Now, this then leads into the production of pauperism. And as he says on 798, the more extensive, finally, the pauperized sections of the working class in the Industrial Reserve Army, the greater is official pauperism. This is the absolute general law of capitalist accumulation. Again, this is strong language. The absolute general law of capitalist accumulation. But then, of course, he introduces his modifier, like all other laws it is modified in its working by many circumstances, the analysis of which does not concern us here. 
Nevertheless, it's a, it's a very strong statement, but you know, it's got his modifier. So, the first word of this adaptation, he says, is the creation of a relative surplus population or industrial reserve army. Its last word is the misery of constantly expanding strata of the active army of labour and the dead weight of pauperism. He says right at the bottom, we saw in part four when analysing the production of relative surplus value that within the capitalist system all methods for raising the social productivity of, productivity of labour are put into effect at the cost of the individual worker. That all means for the development of production undergo a dialectical inversion, so that they become means of domination and exploitation of the producers. They distort the worker into a fragment of a man, they degrade him to the level of an appendage of a machine, they destroy the actual content of his labour by turning it into torment, they alienate from him the intellectual potentialities of the labour process, in the same proportion as science is incorporated in it as an independent power. They deform the conditions under which he works, subject him during the labour process to a despotism the more hateful for its meanness, they transform his lifetime into working time and drag his wife and child beneath the wheels of the juggernaut of capital. But all methods for the production of surplus value are at the same time methods of accumulation, and every extension of accumulation becomes conversely a means for the development of those methods. It follows, therefore, that in proportion as capital accumulates, the situation of the worker, be his payment high or low, must grow worse. Finally, the law which always holds the relative surplus population or industrial reserve army in equilibrium with the extent and energy of accumulation rivets the worker to capital more firmly than the wedges of Hephaestus held Prometheus to the rock. It makes an accumulation of misery a necessary condition, socially necessary condition, corresponding to the accumulation of wealth. Accumulation of wealth at one pole is therefore at the same time accumulation of misery, the torment of labour, slavery, ignorance, brutalisation and moral degradation at the opposite pole, i.e. on the side of the class that produces its own product of capital, as capital. Now, this is of course the famous thesis the increasing immiseration of the proletariat, which is a necessary condition of capitalist accumulation. And you will find people saying immediately, well that's not true, I mean let's face it, the working class in this country is much better off than it was a hundred years ago, and yeah, okay, some of this sort of stuff is maybe going on in China and Bangladesh and Indonesia and so on, but Let's face it, there has been progress for many of the workers of the world, even when they weren't particularly united. So, this is one of Marx's predictions, if you want to call it that, or statements, which is often used, both in a dogmatic way on the part of some Marxists to kind of say, see, this is what capitalism is bound to do, an equally dogmatic way by a lot of non-Marxists who say, well this is what Marx says is bound to happen, it didn't happen that way. And I think here again it's very important to go back to the assumptions. This statement is a statement which is contingent upon the dynamics of accumulation as Marx has set this up. This is volume one of Capital. We are simply looking at the dynamics of production. What goes on within the realm of production and within the realm of capital accumulation, from that standpoint. What we will find is that at the end of volume two, Marx will start to talk about the problems of effective demand, and that the only way in which the effective demand problem can be solved is by, quote, rational consumption on the part of the working class. 
And he means by rational consumption on the part of the working class two things. First, that the working class should have sufficient resources available to itself to be able to consume the goods that capitalists produce. And secondly, that the working class will have acquired the consumption habits whereby it will utilize its money incomes in ways which fit with the dynamic of accumulation. So at the end of volume two we find bourgeois philanthropy is going in and teaching the working class how to consume right, so they can have rational consumption from the standpoint of the dynamics of the accumulation process. So the end of volume two gives you a completely different story to this one. This one says, if capitalism worked like this, just like this, then what would you get? You would get this. Can we see some of this going on in the world economy? The answer is yes. You go to China, or you go to Indonesia, or you go to Bangladesh, and you will see it. Appalling conditions of exploitation. You see people being forced off the land, forced into the cities. The latent reserves are being mobilized all over the place by all kinds of mechanisms. So yes, you'll see the latent reserves being mobilized, and indeed you'll see the agony of toil, and indeed you will see accumulation of wealth at one pole. Right now I don't think anybody would deny that capitalism is about the accumulation of wealth at that pole, right? I mean, there's a huge accumulation of wealth going on. But where is the production going on that backs up that acu a huge accumulation of wealth? And what are the conditions of labor which exist? Well, you can find out plenty of you know, NGOs that have reports, I mean Oxfam and others have reports on this sort of thing, labor organizations have reports on this kind of thing, you'll find reports of this sort of thing in UN reports and so on. So yes, indeed, accumulation of wealth at one pole and accumulation of misery at the other pole. And in many respects over the last thirty years, the accumulation of wealth at the one pole has gone astronomically high, and the accumulation of misery at the other end has gone very much in the other direction. In other words, in many respects, whereas in the 1950s and the 1960s when you had strong labor organizations and social democratic parties and a lot of political pressure, on the consumer side and all the rest of it, you'd argue that in aggregate the whole kind of question of rational consumption was crucial. Get the people to consume automobiles. How do you do that? You build cities where the only way you can get around is with automobiles. Things of that sort. Which means that workers have to have money to buy automobiles and buy the gasoline and all the things that go with it. So indeed, this was not happening in the core parts of the world where capitalism was very well established. But since the kind of neoliberal agenda has taken off, since the 1970s or so, this has increasingly happened. Working class in this country hasn't gone anywhere, but workers have been absorbed into about two billion of them since. 1970, have been mobilized in from the latent reserves into active membership of the proletariat, not least in China, but also, of course, in the Soviet Union, the ex-Soviet Union, and also in several of those countries like India and so on, which had large agrarian bases, large agrarian bases sometimes in Latin America too so that the latent reserves have been really pulled in over the last thirty years. And you would argue 
that you're pretty close, you're much closer to this story that's told at the end of volume one now than you were thirty years ago. And that, in a curious kind of way, is predictable. You see, because what Marx has done, and remember this, what Marx has done is to take, is to take the words of the classical political economists seriously, and imagine we are in a perfectly competitive market society. In other words, he's taken the utopian vision, liberal vision, taken it at its word, and then said, what is the consequence of trying to construct a society around that utopian vision? Adam Smith said what? The consequence is, everybody's going to be better off. Marx's argument is, the closer you get to that utopian vision, the closer you get to accumulation of wealth at one pole and an accumulation of misery at the other pole. And that was how it was working in the nineteenth century, and that's what the neoliberal economic and political project has yielded us over the last thirty years. In other words, it's brought us back much closer to the volume one analysis, to the degree that, ca that capitalism has changed its trajectory and moved back towards that liberal utopian vision in neoliberal guise. So Marx, in a sense, has taken the classical political economists seriously, at their word, step by step shown us how the dynamic of capitalism works, and brought us to the point of saying, if capitalism works this way, and under the assumptions we've already laid out at the beginning, then this is the result that's going to come out. So why would anybody in their right mind take this particular path? Well, the answer is obvious, it's obviously the wealthy, right? And who put us on this path, this neoliberal path? Well, it was the wealthy, who were deciding they weren't getting enough. The wealthy weren't getting enough surplus value. W wages and real wages were going too high. We have to do something about it. What are we going to do? We launch into this version of the model, really push the technological change big time, at the same time as we discipline labour and we outsource and we do all those other things, mobilise the latent populations, and that's what globalisation has been about. It's about creating the, the necessary conditions which allow this result to be achieved, in which there's an immense accumulation of wealth at one pole, with no mind as to what goes on at the other pole. Now what Marx does in section five, as I've suggested to you, is to sort of then talk about what's going on all over the place in Britain at that time. We could write section five about conditions of labour in Nike factories and Gap factories and all the rest of it in Guatemala and Maquila zones and in China and all the rest of it. We could write this stuff. It's not hard to go to the reports in the press and assemble this. In fact, when I used to set exams on this class I, uh, six years ago, one of the exams I set was uh, Imagine you've had a letter from your parents at home saying, oh, I hear you're taking a course on Marx's capital. Uh, isn't it, um, I guess it's pretty interesting that once upon a time capital worked like that, but thank God it's no longer like that. And then I gave them a great wadge of newspaper accounts from respectable sources like the New York Times about, you know, Indonesian factories and Vietnamese factories and what's going on in Guatemala and what happened to Kathy Lee Gifford when she found out that all of her nice clothing system was being produced in Guatemala by 13-year-old kids who hadn't been paid for six months, all those kinds of things. So I said, why don't you, you know, so then construct a letter back to your parents explaining this. So they did, and then I kind of asked them, I said, well, did you send it? 
I said, no, no. Because <laughs> it is actually really quite shocking right now. I mean, you go into that literature and you don't have to go far to find a vast literature in which you could construct the equivalent of section 5 around this thesis and just show how this is going on globally without any difficulty whatsoever. And that again, I think, is a, a part, a tribute to Marx's strength of analysis that he brings you to the point where you can see clearly that a free market system will produce this result to the degree that it's followed, including, by the way, and this is interesting, including the increasing centralization of capital. That the free market system is going to disrupt and destroy its own conditions by actually tending more and more to oligopoly and monopoly and all the rest of it. And that the centralization of capital will go on a pace as well. And if you ask yourself the question, has the centralization of capital increased dramatically over the last 30 years? I think the answer is, oh yes. So in fact you can defend Marx in a conditioned kind of way can defend Marx in this statement come by saying, well, you know, we know that's not the whole story. Like all other laws, it is modified in its working by many circumstances, the analysis of which does not concern us here. Da 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 da. You can introduce the qualifiers, but it certainly tells us something about one of the major trends within a free market capitalism, and where those trends are directed and where they're likely to go. And to the degree that they've gone there, it gives you a great deal, I think, of confidence in Marx's analysis. That this is the way the system works. And how it got there, and how it all started, is of course one of the other big questions which we'll deal with next time. So we're out of time now, so next time I want you to read the whole of part 8, short chapters, not too long, uh, and we need to talk through this. This is, of course, the historical origins of this whole system. This, if you like, is where it's going to. What we've been looking at here is where it's going to, all other things being equal, which they never are. What we're now going to look at is where it came from and how it originated. Okay, so next week we'll take up part eight.